Essential, Essays by the Minimalists. By Joshua Fields Milburn and Ryan Nicodemus. Read by Justin Mollick. Music by We. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Leonardo da Vinci. Chapter 1. Minimalism. Inside the prison walls of consumerism. There's a shopping mall in San Diego that used to be a prison. Restored, repurposed, and redecorated, it's hard to imagine this place once imprisoned hundreds of inmates. One might argue, however, it's a different kind of prison now, a voluntary incarceration caged by the invisible walls of consumption. This might sound hyperbolic, but it's an apt analogy. Consumption isn't the problem. Compulsory consumption is. We've trapped ourselves by thinking consumerism will make us happy, that buying crap we don't need will somehow make us whole. We've gotten good at fooling ourselves too. We've overdecorated the jailhouse walls, walls we built around ourselves, and we've made ourselves so comfortable we're terrified to leave. But a prison cell with a view is still a prison cell. Perhaps there's a key to our escape. What is minimalism? At first glance, people might think the point of minimalism is only to get rid of material possessions, eliminating, jettisoning, extracting, detaching, decluttering, paring down, letting go. That's a mistake though. Removing the excess is an important part of the recipe, but it's just one ingredient. If we're concerned solely with the stuff, then we're missing the larger point. Minimalists don't focus on having less, less, less. Rather, we focus on making room for more, 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 More time, more passion, more experiences, more growth, more contribution, more contentment, and more freedom. It just so happens that clearing the clutter from life's path helps us make that room. Minimalism is a thing that gets us past the things so we can make room for life's important things, which actually aren't things at all. There are many flavors of minimalism. A 20-year-old single guy's minimalist lifestyle looks different from a 45-year-old mother's minimalist life. Even though everyone embraces minimalism differently, each path leads to the same place, a life with more meaning. The irony of minimalism. A word of warning as you consider simplifying your life. If you call yourself a minimalist, or if you tell people you are interested in minimalism, then everything you do will instantly be steeped in irony. Oh, you drive a car? That's not very minimalist of you. Wait, you have more than one pair of shoes? Hypocrite. You own a blow dryer? Phony. What these people don't understand, however, is minimalism is not about deprivation. It's about finding more value in the stuff you own. Minimalists do this by removing the superfluous, keeping only the possessions that serve a purpose or bring joy. Everything else goes by the wayside. There is no minimalist rule book. We're all different. The things that add value to one person's life may not add value to yours. So hold on to that hair straightener, those colorful socks, that collection of angel statuettes, but only if they are appropriate for your life. People will judge, let them. Judgment is but a mirror reflecting the insecurities of the person who's doing the judging. Simple isn't radical. Sometimes people avoid minimalism because the word itself sounds extreme, radical, subversive. Afraid of stepping outside cultural boundaries, these people avoid simplifying their lives because they don't want the label minimalist. If minimalism seems too austere, then perhaps you can relabel your flavor of simplification. May we suggest any of the following isms? Enoughism, essentialism, selectivism, curationism, naturalism, stoicism, epicureanism, appropriatism, simplism, lessism, practicalism, living within your meansism. Call it whatever you want, no matter which ism you favor. The important part is it helps you live with intention. Is minimalism only for single rich white guys? Someone in Montreal asked us this question. Granted, she posited it more congenially than written above, but restated this way, we get to the heart of the matter. We won't bother detailing the many examples that immediately torpedo this assumption. Our friend Leo Babauta and his six kids, Tammy Strobel and her tiny house, Patrick Rohn and his family, and others, none of whom are single, nor rich, nor white guys, and yet they all embrace a minimalist lifestyle. Note, You can read more about minimalist families, including additional books and resources at theminimalist.com forward slash children. Let's look at the question from a broader perspective. The Bureau of Labor Statistics shows that in today's economy, quote, 
is entirely possible for poor people to have much of the same material comforts, cars, televisions, computers, smartphones, as more affluent people, yet be trapped in low-paying jobs with little prospect of improvement, unquote. In other words, rich people and poor people can both be oppressed by the possessions they desire. However, poor people are considerably more stifled because of their lesser, quote-unquote, prospect of improvement. Perhaps minimalism is the, quote-unquote, prospect of improvement. Whenever desire is greater than one's ability to attain, discontentment sets in. By mitigating our impulse to compulsively consume, however, we take back control of our desires, as well as our pocketbooks. According to the New York Times, there is evidence that, quote, money relieves suffering in cases of true material need. But when money becomes an end in itself, it can bring misery too, unquote. Once our basic human needs are met, money doesn't buy happiness, and neither does poverty. People with fewer resources, especially those with less money, can benefit most from minimalism. A minimalist lifestyle helps people determine what truly adds value to their lives. This is even more important when our resources are limited. If we have less money, then we must be more intentional with how we spend it. Simplification begets intentionality. Rich or poor, married or single, black or white, simplifying one's life can only benefit one's circumstances. The Stoics understood this, as did Thoreau, Gandhi, Jesus, and the Buddha. It sure would be nice if everyone else did too. The Gospel of Less No, minimalism is not a religion. Religion is a complicated and sensitive subject for many. Even though we don't typically speak or write about religion, its presence seems to loom over each event we host. Curiosity is natural, so it's inevitable. People often approach us and say things like, it's wonderful to see two guys spreading Jesus Christ's message, which is usually followed by another person saying, it's great to see a couple of Buddhists sharing their story. Or, did you know Muhammad was the original minimalist? In a well-written but unfortunately titled newspaper article in Tennessee, we were recently said to be, quote, spreading the gospel of less, unquote, the connotation of which is a bit troubling. Even more troubling was a radio host take in Oklahoma City when he referred to us as the, quote, L. Ron Hubbard of minimalism, unquote. Thankfully, he was joking. Whatever your religious beliefs, we have no spiritual advice for you. The beautiful thing about minimalism, though, is it works whether you're religious or not. We personally know minimalists who are Christian pastors, minimalists who are practicing Buddhists, minimalists who are atheists. We even know a minimalist rabbi. Because minimalism is a lifestyle that helps people question what things add value to their lives, it applies to any religion, or no religion at all. In fact, the two of us hold radically different religious beliefs. Our journeys towards simplicity, however, had nothing to do with religion. Instead, it was a reaction to the discontentment we experienced after being steeped in consumerism for three decades. We live in a world in which many people have different beliefs, different faiths. But God or no God, we can all live more deliberately. About the minimalists. For us, Joshua and Ryan, it all started with a lingering discontent. A few years ago, while approaching age 30, we had achieved everything that was supposed to make us happy. Great six-figure jobs, nice cars, big houses with more bedrooms and inhabitants, pointless masses of toys, scads of superfluous stuff. And yet with all that stuff, we weren't satisfied with our lives. We weren't happy. There was a gaping void, and working 70 to 80 hours a week for a corporation and buying even more stuff didn't fill the void. It only brought more debt and stress and anxiety and fear and loneliness and guilt and overwhelm and depression. We didn't control our time, and we didn't control our lives. So in 2010, we took back control using the principles of minimalism to focus on what's important. On December 14th, 2010, we started TheMinimalists.com as a way to share our story. In 2011, we left our corporate careers at age 30 to pursue something more meaningful. After publishing our first book, Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life, a book about the five pillars of minimalism, we began contributing to people through writing classes and private mentoring sessions. We have been fortunate to establish an online audience of millions of readers, and our story has been featured in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Forbes, USA Today, National Post, Time Magazine, Today Show, and hundreds of other media outlets. The Boston Globe referred to our story as, quote, Henry David Thoreau, but with Wi-Fi, unquote. We have spoken at Harvard Business School, Apple, and several large conferences, South by Southwest, TEDx, World Domination Summit, as well as many smaller venues, including colleges, corporate groups, libraries, soup kitchens, and various nonprofit organizations. Note, you can watch our TEDx talk at theminimalist.com forward slash TEDx. Toward the end of 2012, we moved from our hometown, Dayton, Ohio, to a cabin outside Phillipsburg, Montana, as a four-month experiment. 
We followed this with a move in 2013 to beautiful Missoula, Montana, where we co-founded Asymmetrical Press, a publishing house for the indie at heart. In 2014, we published a best-selling memoir, Everything That Remains, and donated a year of our lives to a 100-city tour, traveling the globe to share our message at more than 100 free events in eight countries. As of this writing, our newest project, Minimalism, a documentary about the important things, a feature-length film directed by Matt Diavella, in association with Catalyst, Asymmetrical, and Spire Media, is in post-production and will be in theaters and online soon. More details at minimalismfilm.com. This is only the radically condensed version of our story, included here not to impress anyone, but rather to establish a context for this book. Should you want to, you can read the full version of our minimalist journeys in our aforementioned memoir, Everything That Remains. This book, however, is different. About this book, since we started our website, we have written hundreds, if not thousands of essays about a wide array of topics, ranging from simple living and cultivating passion, to writing, publishing, entrepreneurship, health, relationships, personal growth, and contribution. In that time, many people asked us to collect our favorite essays from the blog and organize them in book form, which resulted in three short essay collections early on, The Minimalists, 2011, Simplicity, 2012, and A Day in the Life of a Minimalist, 2013. However, in an effort to simplify our catalog, we decided we should combine all three books, trim the fat from those collections, and add some of our most important recent essays. Effectively, this book is the best of the minimalists, but it's not a book book. It's more like a well-curated website made available in print and ebook formats. Collected here are the most relevant essays, some short, some long, from our website. Most of these essays were written by us together. However, in the cases in which an essay was written solo, it is accompanied by a byline crediting either Joshua or Ryan for his authorship. Parsed into 12 important themes, this collection has been edited and organized into an order that creates an experience appreciably different from reading blog posts online. By bringing our best work together into one tome, we removed any obvious redundancies, although we intentionally kept certain necessary repetitions to reinforce important points, e.g. phrases such as add value, contribute beyond yourself, and meaningful life, appear with some frequency throughout these pages, each time to reiterate our core principles. However, these are individual essays. While we organize this book in a deliberate manner, it is not meant to function as a linear narrative. Rather, this book is meant to serve as a conversation in two ways. First, as a continuous conversation between the authors, Joshua and Ryan, and the reader. And second, as a conversation starter between the reader and the people in their life. Every essay that follows is a single standalone ingredient. Our intent is to provide all the ingredients you need to create your own recipe for an extraordinary life. Constructing an Extraordinary Life An extraordinary life doesn't just happen. It is constructed, crafted, curated. We ought not simply go with the flow, then. Going with the flow is nice and easy for a while, riding the current wherever it might take us, but eventually everyone ends up at the same place, the rapids. And then, unprepared, we're in for a world of hurt. Your two authors both have extraordinary lives. We're not ashamed to admit this. It wasn't always this way, though. For the longest time, our lives were unremarkable at best, miserable at worst. Too long we went with the flow. As a result, we were fat, in debt, and unfulfilled by the lives we were leading, lives filled with every conceivable type of clutter. Mental clutter, emotional clutter, physical clutter. We had reached the rapids, and we were quickly headed for the falls. Then we decided to change. An extraordinary life, a life to be proud of, is a decision. Not a single decision, but a myriad of little decisions each day. Daily decisions about money, and health, and passion, and contribution one day at a time. These decisions add up until one day you look over your shoulder and realize you've created an extraordinary life. Whom this book is for. Your two authors have learned more than we ever dreamed throughout our journey into minimalism, and we're still learning. The most important lesson we've learned, though, is minimalism appeals to only one group of people, people with an open mind. During our coast-to-coast travels, we've experienced a diverse group of people, Thousands of people have attended our events, from factory workers to CEOs, from attorneys to stand-up comics, from 11-year-old boys to 83-year-old great-grandmothers, from every ethnicity to every socioeconomic background, from high school dropouts to college professors, from marathon runners to people struggling to lose weight, from single moms to parents bringing their teenagers to hear about a simpler life. Minimalism is applicable to anyone, anyone with an open mind. We're all searching for meaningful lives. You are not alone. Not utopia, but a better world. 
No, minimalism will not solve all your problems. Unfortunately, people sometimes believe the goal of simple living is to own as few possessions as possible, to declutter our homes, to organize our lives, and to clear our minds. Once we do this, we'll each find our utopia and bask in the glory of newfound happiness, right? Not exactly. Real life doesn't work this way. Minimalism is not the end game. It is not the result. Chucking your material possessions does not necessarily equal happiness. You could get rid of all your stuff and still be miserable. Getting rid of the excess in your life will, however, help you discover what does make you happy. Hint, it's not your possessions. Most of your possessions are actually in the way of your happiness. It's much easier to find the path toward happiness once you've cleared the debris. Minimalism will never lead you to your utopia. Life will always have its moments of tedium, drudgery, sadness, and pain, but minimalism can lead you to a better life, one that's more exciting, fulfilling, satisfying, and rewarding. You can start small, but it's worth getting started today. After you read this book, which is organized to be read in small chunks, one essay at a time, you can find additional free resources, games, photos, podcasts, and videos to help you plan your journey at theminimalist.com. Let's begin, shall we? Chapter two, stuff. Consumption is not the problem. We all need some stuff. Many of us take it too far, though. The average American household contains more than 300,000 possessions. We've accumulated more than we need in hopes they'll make us happy in some hypothetical future. But it won't. We know this. Needing more will always lead to a pall of desire until we feel trapped by consumption. Purchasing more stuff to make us happy, following consumerism's broken template, is a real issue, not consumption. The solution then is to consume deliberately, to ignore the bullshit advertisements and determine what we need based on our own lives, not what we've been told we need. We're all different. What we need is different for each of us. You are what you desire. Every whole person has wants, cravings, aspirations. We all desire something. We don't, however, all have the same desires. Some of us long to create something purposeful, to make a difference in the world, to eschew the so-called American dream in favor of something better, something more deliberate, an experience-driven life of intentionality instead of a life pushed toward the wrong side of the consumption continuum. On the other hand, some of us watch the luminous box flickering in our living rooms and yearn for the material things in its advertisements, the things that bring us stress, discontent, and often keep us tied to a particular income, which keeps us tied to jobs we don't love, or worse, jobs we hate, all so we can obtain the shiny objects projected on the glowing rectangle. In truth, most of us desire both. We desire the experiences and the stuff. Usually the latter gets in the way of the former. Too often our material desires get in the way of a more meaningful life. We are what we desire. The rats in the tunnel. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. We all know this. Even when it's hard to find, we know it's there just beyond the bend. Finding the light isn't the hardest part of life's journey. It's dealing with what's hiding in the tunnel. What lurks in the darkness keeps us from focusing on the light. Anytime we visit New York City, we might see oversized rats scurrying down the blackened train tracks below the subway platform. If we jump down and walk those tracks, we will find the light at the end of the subway tunnel, eventually. Finding the light isn't what worries us. What worries us are the rats in the tunnel. We must contend with whatever stalks the darkness, what waits to trip us up and keep us from the light. The rats are no different from the plethora of obstacles getting in our way every day. The mundane tasks, the banal distractions, the vapid, harmful ways we pacify ourselves. Minimalism allows us to remove those obstacles and focus on the light. It allows us to shoo the rats from the tunnel and find the light more quickly. Minimalism allows us to swiftly exit the tunnel and avoid the malevolent, filthy creatures lurking in the darkness. And the light is so much brighter when you get out of the tunnel. What are your rats? What keeps you in the tunnel hidden from the light? Shopping? Television? Internet? Debt? Clothes? Gadgets and consumer electronics? Overeating? Something else? What can you get rid of to focus on the light? What can you remove from your life to make it more meaningful? Adequate. You are inadequate. At least that's what advertisers would like you to believe. You bear witness to proof of your inadequacy every day. You see it on your TV, hear it on your radio, stare back at it on your computer screen and on highway billboards. There are plenty of messages all around you to reinforce your utter inadequacy. If you're a male, you're not a real man unless you drink this brand of beer, 
and eat this particular cut of meat and drive this brand of sport utility vehicle. And if you're a female, you're not a real woman unless you squeeze into this size dress and don this shiny piece of jewelry and tote this purse with all the ostentatious C's or LV's on his leather exterior. Then, and only then, will you feel adequate, or so they'd have you believe. But when you obtain these things, what happens? Do you feel long-term adequacy? No, of course not. Your thirst for overindulgent consumption isn't quenched when you obtain more material possessions. It's just the opposite. Your desire to consume increases. You've set the bar higher, and thus the threshold for future satisfaction is higher. It's a vicious cycle. Consumption is an unquenchable thirst. You create that thirst. You manufacture the desire to consume more. Advertisers play their role. They help activate the desire you create, but ultimately the desire is yours to control. Once you realize you have control, you can break the cycle. You can avoid the continuous downward spiral. There's one way out of consumption spiral. We must realize the things we purchase do not define who we are unless we allow them to. If we are defined by our things, we will never be happy. But if we are defined by our actions, then we'll have the opportunity to feel fulfilled by our everyday growth. We'll have the opportunity to feel satisfied with our everyday contribution to others and we'll have the opportunity to be content every day of our lives. The stuff doesn't make you happy. You make you happy. How we woke up. Every moth is drawn to light, even when that light is a flame, hot, burning, flickering, the fire tantalizing the drab creature with its bluish white illumination. But when the moth flies too close to the flame, we all know what happens. It gets burned, incinerated by the very thing that drew it near. For decades now, we consumers have been moths, lured by the blue flame of consumerism, pop culture's beautiful conflagration, a firestorm of lust and greed and wanting, a solipsistic desire to consume that which cannot be consumed, to be fulfilled by that which can never be fulfilling, a vacant proposition, leaving us empty inside, further fueling the blaze of lust and greed and wanting. From our intimate vantage points, within reach of the flame's scorching edges, the fire seems impossible to extinguish. Unlike the moth, though, we have a choice. It is not an easy choice. The flame is ever more intriguing. Advertisers make sure of this. It is their job to find new ways to make the blaze eternally more appealing. Some of us recognize a need for change. Others know change is necessary, but refuse to stop circling the mesmerizing flame. They can't remove their eyes from the spill of electric light illuminating their homes. Still, others don't realize it's a flame at all. How could something so beautiful be so dangerous? So they circle the inferno, unconscious of its dangers. We must, however, accept the flame for what it is, necessary, beautiful, and most of all, dangerous. When we do this, when we step back to understand the nature of the fire, we have a chance to survive. This takes deliberate thought, repeated questioning of the way we live, a thorough understanding of why we feel comforted by the flame. It is difficult to do, but this is how we wake up. Haunted by desire. The ghosts of desperation, lust, and envy hide in the shadow of our yearning. Be it money, material possessions, or accolades, we are haunted by our aspirations. Covet that shiny new truck, that next big promotion, that beautiful man or woman, and you will feel unspeakable pain until it, he, or she is yours. When your desire is met, however, your flame is not extinguished. You're filled with new desires. It's a never-ending cycle. The key then is to aspire towards something worthwhile. Instead of jonesing for things, we must pursue those which are without definitive milestones, growth, contribution, love. These qualities are self-fulfilling. Seek growth and you will grow. Endeavor to give to others and you will contribute. Love others and your cup will overflow. It is not wrong to have aspirations, desires, goals, but it is wrong for us to imagine we can ever satiate our ever-growing need for more. In too deep. It's easy to believe Earth turns slowly on its axis. It's always there. We're a part of it deep in the middle of its rotation. In many ways, consumerism is the same way. It's all around us, everywhere we turn, seemingly unstoppable, hell's self-consuming heart. But Earth doesn't turn slowly. It's spinning at over a thousand miles an hour. This became easy for us to understand once we stepped back and paid attention, once we became aware of our surroundings. Similarly, we needn't look around at all this mass consumption and overindulgence and believe it's normal. It's not. Things haven't always been this way, this chaotic, this meaningless, and the future needn't be either. 
A sunrise is on the horizon, and we can see it once we open our eyes, become more aware of what's important, and realize we're in too deep. Minimalism Scares the Shit Out of Me by Ryan Nicodemus Minimalism scares the shit out of you. You're worried you'll get rid of stuff you'll need later. You're worried what your friends, your family, your coworkers, and your neighbors will think of you. You're worried you'll lose your identity, your status, and everything you've given meaning to in your life. Me too. Minimalism still scares the shit out of me. I know there are many people who are as scared as me, and I'm here to tell you that's okay. I've always been the type of person who puts his whole heart into his beliefs. When I take on a particular ideal or way of life, I make the most of it. I do this to a fault. I have such high expectations of myself that I often expect perfection, which is probably why I stress out easier than most, why I have more anxiety than most. On top of the expectations, a lot of people around me love to point out every non-minimal thing I have in my life. They love to talk about how I own a condo, wear nice shoes, and have a nice haircut. Yes, someone actually brought up my haircut. And the list goes on and on. But these people are only projecting. They feel as though I'm judging them because I don't live the way they do anymore. You might be thinking, Ryan, why do you care what people think? It's not about my caring as much as these people reaffirming negative things I already think about myself, with the exception of my haircut, which I'm quite fond of, thank you very much. I'm aware there are many things in my life I still need to minimize. The simplifying process, like life, is ever-changing. Minimalism is fluid. As our circumstances change, our versions of the simple life must change too. The beautiful thing about minimalism is there is no right or wrong. There is no pace at which you must live your life, and there's nothing that says, this is how you have to live. Minimalism is a journey, and it is scary for everyone. Decluttering doesn't work like that. Decluttering is, by and large, a farce. If you picked up this book to figure out how to declutter your closet, you're in the wrong place. You'll be hard-pressed to find anything here even vaguely resembling something as trite as 67 ways to declutter a messy home. That's because decluttering alone doesn't solve the problem. Discussing how to get rid of your stuff answers only the what, but not the why. The what, i.e. the how-to, is easy. We all know instinctually how to declutter. You can start small, focus on one room at a time, making progress each day as you work toward a simplified life, You can go big, rent a dumpster, and throw out everything, moving on to a more fulfilling life. Or you can take the moderate approach, plunge into a packing party and embrace the fun side of decluttering, enjoying the entire simplification process. People should, however, be more concerned with the why, the purpose behind decluttering, than the what. While the what is easy, the why is far more obscure because the nature of the why is highly individual. Ultimately, it has to do with the benefits you'll experience once you're on the other side of decluttering. Decluttering is not the end result, it is merely the first step. You don't become instantly happy and content by just getting rid of your stuff, at least not in the long run. Decluttering doesn't work like that. If you simply embrace the what without the why, then you'll get nowhere, slowly and painfully by the way, repeatedly making the same mistakes. It is possible to get rid of everything you own and still be utterly miserable to come home to your empty house and sulk after removing all your pacifiers. When you get rid of the vast majority of your possessions, you're forced to confront your darker side. When did I give so much meaning to material possessions? What is truly important in life? Why am I discontent? Who is this person I want to become? How will I define my own success? These are difficult questions with no easy answers, but these questions are far more important than just ditching your material possessions. If you don't answer them carefully, rigorously, then the closet you just decluttered will be brimming with new purchases not long from now. Organizing is well-planned hoarding. We need to start thinking of organizing as a dirty word. It is a sneaky little profanity that keeps us from simplifying our lives. Our televisions would have us believe there's a battle being fought on the consumption continuum, a battle between the organizers and the hoarders. And from our couches, it's hard to see who's winning. We posit to you these two sides are working together, colluding to achieve the same thing, the accumulation of more stuff. One side, the hoarders, does so overtly, leaving everything out in the open, making them easy targets to sneer at. But the other side, the sneaky organizers, are more covert, more systematic, more devious when it comes to the accumulation of stuff. Ultimately though, organizing is nothing more than well-planned hoarding. Sure, both sides go about their hoarding differently, but the end result is not appreciably different. Whether our homes are strewn with wall-to-wall material possessions, or we have a complex ordinal item dispersal system, color-coded and alphabetized, we're still not dealing with the real problem. No matter how organized we are, 
We must continue to care for the stuff we organize, cleaning and sorting our methodically structured belongings. When we get rid of the superfluous stuff, we can focus on life's more important aspects. We can spend the day focusing on our health, on our relationships, on pursuing our passions, or we can reorganize the basement again. Once the excess stuff is out of the way, staying organized is much easier. A Short Guide to Getting Rid of Your Crap by Joshua Fields Milburn and Julian Smith. Yay, it's Friday. Time to head home and relax after a week of hard work. Step one, enter the front door of your home. Toss off your shoes. Notice sitting behind the door a pair of boots you have worn only once. Shrug. Step two, turn on the television and sit on your Ikea couch. Attempt to relax. Awaken 20 minutes later, realizing you've been passively flipping through channels. Turn off the TV and remove the batteries from your remote. Toss them in your Blendtec blender. Stop yourself moments away from doing something drastic. Step three, briefly fondle the iPhone in your pocket. Stop yourself, realizing you're about to do the exact same thing with YouTube as you did with TV. Delete every unnecessary app from your phone. Step four, wonder what people did before television and internet access. Observe the room around you, looking over the unread books and unwatched DVDs lining your dusty shelves. Consider shopping, then picture the unworn clothes occupying your cavernous walk-in closet. Step five, Realize your imagination has turned all black and gray, the creativity drained from your life. Step six, suddenly recognize you haven't used your spare room ever. Shit, do the math and realize said room is costing you five or six hours of work per month. Take out a piece of paper and compare it to that trip to Europe you've been meaning to take. Stare at the math in disbelief. Stuff the paper in your mouth and begin to chew. Step seven, Realize the brief emotional rush that accompanied the purchase of each item in your home is now gone, leaving only the object itself in its most basic, uninteresting form. The gorgeous, pastel designer couch has become simply a chair. A beautiful glass buffet is transformed into a mere table. A set of immaculate handmade dishes has aged into nothing but a bunch of plates. Your goose-down duvet is actually just a blanket. Wince. Step 8. Glance down at your groceries and realize the Doritos, Lay's, and Ruffles you purchased are nothing but colored corn and potatoes. Step nine, open your credit card bill. Wide-eyed, discover how often you've confused shopping with actual extracurricular activities. Consider joining a monastery. Step 10, remember that time you went over to a party in a friend's loft. Recall the roommates, the self-made art and photos on the walls, the obscenely cheap rent, the happiness and simplicity of it all. Step 11, quickly create a list of the top 10 things you own in terms of how much they cost. With horror, make a second list of the top 10 things that make you happy. Sense the creeping dread as you realize there is no overlap between the two. Shudder. Step 12, decide to have a packing party like your friend suggested one time. Take the old sheets you never use from Crate and Barrel, cover all your stuff with them. Endeavor not to uncover it unless you decide you need to use it suddenly realize you will never use anything because you are never home. Step 13. Remember a time in childhood when you were more excited by ideas, love, travel, and people than by anything else. Realize you have somehow bought into a new religion and that malls from the inside look exactly like cathedrals. Step 14. Consider starting a fire. Step 15. Consider that perhaps you are more than just your stuff. Begin to take a long walk. Breathe. Step 16, begin to relax. Give yourself the freedom to begin to dream again. A Well-Edited Life by Joshua Fields Milburn Everyone develops their own creative process over time. Some sculptors, Bernini for instance, build sculptures with clay. Others, like Michelangelo, carve from marble. Though I'm no Michelangelo, my creative process tends to mimic the latter building way too much, and then removing massive amounts of excess until I uncover the beauty beneath the banality. I call this process subtractive creation. Unlike most carving sculptors, though, I also have to quarry the marble from which I pitch, chisel, and polish. The essays on our website are published with around 400 words, even though they often start with 2,000 or more. My novel was 950 pages before it entered the world with only 252. The book you're reading now was 700 pages at its bloated apex. Now it's fewer than half. When I edit this way, the final result is far more meaningful to me and to the reader. The care and handcraftedness shows in the final work. I teach my writing students how to edit this way too. 
That is, how to spend one-third of their time writing effectively and two-thirds of their time editing, shaping their work into something more concise, more powerful, more beautiful. Subtractive creation seems to be an appropriate metaphor for the rest of life as well. There will always be life's excess, always more, always too many inputs bombarding us from every direction. But instead of abhorrent multitasking, instead of trying to get things done, we can make life more beautiful via subtraction. We can filter out the noise. We can remove unnecessary material possessions. We can let go of sentimental items. We can get rid of negative relationships. We can avoid the American dream. And when everyone is looking for more, we can focus on less. Sure, there's an infinite amount of materials with which to build our lives, but sometimes the best way to build is to subtract. The best lives are often well-edited, carefully curated lives. P.S. Yes, I know Bernini also sculpted with marble. You are not impressing me. Our Please Like Me culture has transformed into something hideous. We've been enveloped by an epidemic of pointless, attention-grabbing solipsism. Look around, the world is attempting to impress you. We needn't impress anyone, and yet we all try. Relentlessly, we try, doing the strangest things to get the attention and, ultimately, the approval of others. Oh, you purchased a brand new Lexus? You're a published author? Your job title is X and you earn six figures? So what? Take it from two guys who had it all, who had to get everything we ever wanted to realize that everything we ever wanted wasn't what we wanted at all. It was empty, meaningless, depressing. Your material possessions, your social status, and even your so-called accomplishments don't impress anyone. They certainly don't impress us. You impress us, not the things around you. We are impressed by your commitment to change, by your ability to grow, by your desire to contribute beyond yourself. Everything else is just a social construct, devoid of meaning. There's nothing inherently wrong with owning possessions, accomplishing goals, or earning money. Just don't think those things impress anyone. They don't. At least not in a meaningful way. I counted all my stuff. The most unfortunate misconception we encounter about minimalism has to do with the act of counting your possessions. I could never be a minimalist because I don't want to live with less than 100 things. We hear that a lot. Even well-regarded internet stars inadvertently promulgate this misconception, saying odd things like, I'm not a minimalist, I have no desire to move to a 300-square-foot apartment and religiously track the number of socks I own. Yeah, neither do we. Seeing people propagate such misconceptions is unfortunate because it gives an important movement a black eye and scares people away from something greater. Often the people promoting such ideas do so without malice, but they do so because they are afraid of labels. But some labels are helpful. Minimalism has helped thousands of people discover meaning in their lives. It has never been about counting stuff. Even our friend Dave Bruno, the author of The 100 Thing Challenge, would be the first person to attest to this. Dave lived for a long time with only 100 things as a personal challenge, but the reason he did so was to prove our constant consumption is void of meaning, but the number of possessions is arbitrary. As a parodic take on why counting isn't necessary, Joshua counted his stuff last year. That essay, Everything I Own, My 288 Things, theminimalist.com forward slash 288, is ironically one of the most popular essays on our site. The ostensible subject, counting your possessions, was not the true subject. It was not the point. The point was that taking a physical inventory of your life is eye-opening, and it helps you get rid of unnecessary items so you can appreciate what you have. You don't have to count your stuff, although you can if you want. Either way, minimalism can help you live more and need less, irrespective of how many pairs of socks you own. Start with the easy stuff. Baffled by life's excess, we often look around at our piles of miscellanea and throw our hands in the air. There's so much emotion, so many memories wrapped up in our possessions. Although, of course, the memories aren't in the possessions, they're inside us, and that's where they'll always be. But still, letting go is difficult. Difficult, but not impossible. Want to start simplifying? First, avoid sentimental items and difficult to part with objects. You'll never get started if you're faced with all that heavy lifting. And stay away from the most onerous rooms, basements, garages, and attic. They will only overwhelm you. Instead, start with the easy things. The superfluous clothes jammed in the closet, the junk drawers teeming with junk, the unused kitchenware taking up space just in case. If you begin with the things that are painless, then as inertia takes over, simplifying gets easier by the day. Moreover, the journey toward a simpler life is more enjoyable with an accountability partner. A new month is always peeking its head around the corner, which means it's the perfect time to play the 30-day minimalism game, theminimalist.com forward slash game. So grab a friend, clear the clutter, 
and have some fun together. Letting Go of Sentimental Items by Joshua Fields Milburn My mother died in 2009. She lived a thousand miles away and it was my responsibility to vacate her apartment in Florida. It was a small, one-bedroom place, but it was packed wall-to-wall with her belongings. Mom had great taste. She could have been an interior designer, and none of her stuff was junk. Nevertheless, there was a lot of stuff in her home. Mom was constantly shopping, always accumulating more stuff. She had antique furniture throughout her apartment, a stunning oak canopy bed that consumed almost her entire bedroom, two closets jam-packed with clothes, picture frames standing on every flat surface, original artwork adorning the walls, and tasteful decorations in every nook, cranny, and crevasse. There was 64 years of accumulation in that apartment. So I did what any son would do. I rented a large truck from U-Haul. Then I called a storage place back in Ohio to make sure they had a big enough storage unit. The truck was $1,600, the storage facility was $120. Financially, I could afford it, but I quickly found out the emotional cost was much higher. At first, I didn't want to let go of anything. If you've ever lost a parent, a loved one, or been through a similarly emotional time, then you understand exactly how hard it was for me to let go of any of those possessions. So instead of letting go, I wanted to cram every trinket, figurine, and piece of oversized furniture into that storage locker in Ohio, floor to ceiling. That way I knew that mom's stuff was there if I ever wanted it, if I ever needed access to it for some incomprehensible reason. I even planned to put a few pieces of mom's furniture in my home as subtle reminders of her. I started boxing up her belongings, every picture frame, every porcelain doll, and every white doily on every shelf. I packed every bit of her that remained, or so I thought. I looked under her bed. Among the organized chaos that compromised the crawl space beneath her bed, there were four boxes, each labeled with a number. Each numbered box was sealed with packing tape. I cut through the tape and found old papers from my elementary school days from nearly a quarter century ago, spelling tests, cursive writing lessons, artwork, It was all there, every shred of paper from my first four years of school. It was evident she hadn't accessed the sealed boxes in years, yet mom had held on to these things because she was trying to hold on to pieces of me, pieces of the past, much like I was attempting to hold on to pieces of her and her past. I realized my retention efforts were futile. I could hold on to her memories without her stuff, just as she had always remembered me, my childhood, and all our memories without ever accessing those sealed boxes under her bed. She didn't need papers from 25 years ago to remember me, just as I didn't need a storage locker filled with her stuff to remember her. I called U-Haul and canceled the truck. And then, over the next 12 days, I donated her stuff to places and people who could use it. Of course, it was difficult to let go, but I realized many things about our relationship between memories and possessions during the entire experience. I am not my stuff. We are more than our possessions. Our memories are within us, not within our things. Holding on to stuff imprisons us. Letting go is freeing. You can take pictures of items you want to remember. Old photographs can be scanned. An item that is sentimental for us can be useful for someone else. I don't think sentimental items are bad or evil or that holding on to them is wrong. I don't. I think the danger of sentimental items and sentimentality in general is far more subtle. If you want to get rid of an item, but the only reason you are holding on to it is for sentimental reasons, if it is weighing on you, then perhaps it's time to get rid of it. Perhaps it's time to free yourself of the weight. That doesn't mean you need to get rid of everything, though. When I returned to Ohio, I had four boxes of mom's photographs in my trunk, which I would later scan and back up online. I found a scanner that made scanning the photos easy, theminimalist.com forward slash scanning. Those photos are digital now, and they can be used in digital picture frames instead of collecting dust in a basement. I no longer have the clutter of their boxes lying around and weighing me down, and they can never be destroyed in a fire. I donated everything else strewn throughout her home, her furniture, her clothes, and her decorative items. It was a giant leap for me, but I felt it must be done to remove the weight, the emotional gravitas of the situation from my shoulders. I don't need mom's stuff to remind me of her. There are traces of her everywhere, in the way I act, in the way I treat others, even in the way I smile. She's still there, and she was never part of her stuff. Whenever I give advice on paring down, I tend to give two options. The first option is usually the giant leap option, the dive-in head-first option, e.g. get rid of everything, smash your TV, throw out all your stuff, quickly rip off the band-aid, etc. This option isn't for everyone, and it's often not for me, but in this case, that's what I did. I donated everything. The second option is to take baby steps. It works because it helps you build momentum by taking action. What sentimental item can you get rid of today that you've wanted to get rid of for a while? Start there. 
then pick one or two things per week and gradually increase your efforts as you feel more comfortable. Whichever option you choose, take action. Never leave the scene of a good idea without taking action. Packing Party, Unpack a Simpler Life by Ryan Nicodemus. What makes a rich person rich? When I was a teenager, I thought it was $50,000 a year. When I started climbing the corporate ladder in my early 20s, I soon earned 50 grand. Something was wrong though, I didn't feel rich. So I went back to the drawing board and discovered my error. I forgot to adjust for inflation. Maybe $75,000 a year was rich. Maybe $90,000, maybe six figures. Or maybe owning a bunch of stuff, maybe that was rich. Whatever rich was, I knew that once I got there, I'd finally be happy. So as I made more money, I spent more money, all in the pursuit of the American dream, all in the pursuit of happiness. But the closer I got, the further away happiness was. Five years ago, my life was different from what it is today, radically different. I had everything I ever wanted, everything I was quote unquote supposed to have. I had an impressive job title at a respectable corporation, a successful career managing dozens of employees. I earned a six-figure income. I bought a shiny new car every few years. I owned a huge three-bedroom, two-bathroom, 2,000-square-foot condo. It even had two living rooms. Other than maintaining several playrooms for my cat, I have no idea why a single guy needs two living rooms. My cat and I were living the American dream. Everyone around me said I was successful, but I was only ostensibly successful. You see, I also had a bunch of things that were hard to see from the outside. Even though I earned a lot of money, I had heaps of debt. Chasing the American dream cost me a lot more than money. My life was filled with stress, anxiety, and discontent. I was miserable. I may have looked successful, but I certainly didn't feel successful. It got to a point where I didn't know what was important anymore. But one thing was clear, there was a gaping void in my life. So I tried to fill that void the same way many people do, with stuff, lots of stuff. I attempted to fill the void with consumer purchases. I bought new cars, new electronics, and new expensive clothes. I bought expensive furniture, home decorations, and all the latest gadgets. When I didn't have enough cash in the bank, I paid for expensive meals, rounds of drinks, and frivolous vacations with credit cards. I spent money faster than I earned it in an attempt to buy my way to happiness. And I thought I'd get there one day. Happiness had to be just around the corner. But the stuff didn't fill the void, it widened it. And because I didn't know what was important, I continued to fill the void with stuff, going further into debt, working hard to buy things that weren't making me happy. This went on for years, a demoralizing cycle. By my late 20s, my life on the outside looked great, but inside, I was a mess. I was several years divorced. I was unhealthy. I felt stuck. I drank a lot. I did drugs a lot. I used as many pacifiers as I could. And I continued to work 60, 70, sometimes 80 hours a week, forsaking the most important aspects of my life. I barely ever thought about my health, my relationships, my passions. Worst of all, I felt stagnant. I wasn't growing and I certainly wasn't contributing to others. My life lacked meaning, purpose, passion. If you would have asked me what I was passionate about, I would have looked at you like a deer in the headlights. What am I passionate about? I had no idea. I was living paycheck to paycheck, living for a paycheck, living for stuff, living for a career I didn't love. I wasn't really living at all though, I was depressed. Then, as I was approaching age 30, I noticed something different about my best friend of 20 years. Josh seemed happy for the first time in a long time, like truly happy, ecstatic. But why? We had worked side by side at the same corporation throughout our 20s, both climbing the ranks, and he had been just as miserable as me. Something significant had changed. To boot, he had just gone through two of the most difficult events of his life. His mother had just passed away, and his marriage had ended, both in the same month. He wasn't supposed to be happy, and he definitely wasn't supposed to be happier than me. So I did what any good friend would do. I bought him lunch at a fine dining establishment. We went to Subway. While we were eating our sandwiches, I asked Josh, why the hell are you so happy? Josh spent the next 20 minutes telling me about something called minimalism. He talked about how he'd spent the last few months simplifying his life, getting the clutter out of the way to make room for what was truly important. And then he showed me an entire community of people who had done the same thing. He introduced me to a guy named Colin Wright, a 24-year-old entrepreneur who travels to a new country every four months, carrying with him everything he owns. Then there was Joshua Becker, a 36-year-old husband and father of two, with a full-time job and a car and a house in suburban Vermont. Next, he showed me Courtney Carver, a 40-year-old wife and mother to a teenage daughter in Salt Lake City. And there was Leo Babauta, a 38-year-old husband and father of six in San Francisco. 
Although all these people led considerably different lives, they all shared at least two things in common. First, they were living deliberate, meaningful lives. They were passionate and purpose-driven, and they seemed much richer than any of the so-called rich guys I worked with in the corporate world. Second, they all attributed their improved lives to this thing called minimalism. So being the problem solver I am, I decided to become a minimalist right there on the spot. I looked up at Josh and excitedly announced, all right, I'm in, I'm a minimalist. Um, now what? You see, I didn't want to spend months slowly paring down my possessions like Josh had. That was fine for him, but I needed faster results. So we came up with a crazy idea. Let's throw a packing party. Everything is more fun when you put party at the end. We decided to pack all my belongings as if I were moving, and then I would unpack only the items I needed over the next three weeks. Josh came over and helped me box up everything. My clothes, my kitchenware, my towels, my electronics, my TVs, my framed photographs and paintings, my toiletries, even my furniture, everything. We literally pretended I was moving. After nine hours and a few pizza deliveries, everything was packed. There we were, sitting in my second living room, feeling exhausted, staring at boxes stacked halfway to my 12-foot ceiling. My condo was empty, and everything smelled like cardboard. Everything I owned, every single thing I had worked for over the past decade was there in that room. Boxes stacked on top of boxes, stacked on top of boxes. Each box was labeled so I'd know where to go when I needed a particular item. Labels like living room, junk drawer number one, kitchen utensils, bedroom closet, junk drawer number seven, and so on. I spent the next 21 days unpacking only the items I needed. My toothbrush, my bed and bed sheets, clothes for work, the furniture I actually used, kitchenware, a tool set, just the things that added value to my life. After three weeks, 80% of my stuff was still in those boxes, just sitting there, unaccessed. I looked at those boxes and I couldn't remember what was in most of them. All those things that were supposed to make me happy weren't doing their job. So I sold some of it and then donated the rest. And you know what? I started to feel rich for the first time in my life. I felt rich once I got everything out of the way so I can make room for everything that remains. Photo Scanning Party by Joshua Fields Milburn If you're gonna ask for one physical gift this year for the holidays, consider a good photo scanner. If you're like me, then you've probably let the overstuffed boxes and photo albums go unchecked over the years, and now they're collecting dust in your basement or closet unused, just sitting there waiting for one day to come. One day, two of the most dangerous words in the English language. I too held on to heaps of meaningful photos that added no value to my life because they were hidden away, and the prospect of dealing with them seemed daunting, overwhelming, not worth the hassle. So I let them sit in the attic, the cupboard, the garage. Then, inspired by Ryan's packing party, I decided to throw a photo scanning party. It turns out that if you put party at the end of anything, Ryan will show up. First, I found a high-quality scanner, theminimalist.com forward slash scanning, that allows me to rapidly feed photos and immediately save them to a memory card, which I could then use in a couple high-res digital picture frames. What a novel idea, actually display my treasured photos. Plus, if anything were to happen to my home, flood, fire, robbery, all my photos are backed up online. Thus, I'll never worry about losing those memories. Of course, the memories aren't in our material possessions, but I found that a well-curated photo collection can help trigger all the wonderful memories of yesteryear without all the physical baggage. Next, to make my party a little more fun and less lonely, I invited a few friends over, ordered food and drinks, and together we thumbed through the photographs of my childhood and all of its double-chinned grandeur, scanning my favors to display. I have one remaining box of photos I'm gonna scan this month. I think another scanning party is in order. Feel free to join me. Scan your own photos and share some of your favorites on Twitter or Instagram using our scanning party hashtag. Getting rid of just-in-case items. We often hold on to things just in case we need them. We don't let go because we might need something in some far-off, non-existent, hypothetical future. And we pack too much stuff for trips and vacations just in case. We needn't hold on to these things just in case. The truth is, we rarely use our just-in-case items, and so they sit there, take up space, get in the way, weigh us down. Most of the time, they aren't items we need at all. Instead, if we remove the just-in-case items from our lives, we can get them out of the way. We can free up the space they consume. Over the last few years, the two of us let go of the vast majority of our just-in-case possessions. And during our last tour, we made sure we didn't pack anything just-in-case. And then we tested our theory, the 2020 rule. 
Anything we get rid of that we truly need, we can replace for less than $20 in less than 20 minutes from our current location. Thus far, this theory has held true 100% of the time. Although we've rarely had to replace a just-in-case item, fewer than five times for the two of us combined, we've never had to pay more than $20 or go more than 20 minutes out of our way to replace the item. This theory likely works 99% of the time for 99% of all items and 99% of all people, including you. More important, we haven't missed the hundreds of just-in-case items we've gotten rid of, and we didn't need to replace most of them. Getting rid of these items clears one's mind, frees up their space, and takes the weight off his or her shoulders. What are you holding on to, just in case? 90-90 rule. Rules can be arbitrary, restrictive, boring, but they are often helpful when we hope to make a change. Whenever we attempt to simplify our lives, we often get stuck before we get started. When faced with a horde of possessions, some useful, others not, it is difficult to determine what serves a purpose and what we're holding on to just in case, which makes letting go nearly impossible without some sort of rules to move us in the right direction. Here's one that has worked for us. Look at a possession. Pick something, anything. Have you used that item in the last 90 days? If you haven't, will you use it in the next 90? If not, then it's okay to let go. Maybe your rule isn't 90 days. Maybe it's 120. Maybe it's six months. Whatever your rule, be honest with yourself. If your material possessions don't bring you joy, then they are likely in the way of a more intentional life. When Everything is Your Favorite Thing by Joshua Fields Milburn. When you get rid of most of your stuff, your life invariably changes. Without all the things in your way, you have the opportunity to focus on the most important aspects of your life. But there was also an unexpected benefit from my newly uncluttered life. Now I truly enjoy everything I own. Before I embraced minimalism, I had a lot of stuff a three-bedroom house teeming with stuff, a basement and a two-car garage filled with boxes overflowing with stuff, spare bedrooms and closets and cabinets jam-packed with stuff, every nook, every cranny, more stuff. It was hard to keep track of it, and all that stuff added very little value to my life. It often just made me feel anxious, overwhelmed, and depressed. I was unhappy with the way I felt, so I started questioning everything I owned. Today, I don't own much, but the things I do own add immense value to my life. When I got rid of my extraneous material possessions, what remained were the things I use every day. Now nearly everything I own is my favorite thing. All my clothes are my favorite clothes. All my furniture is my favorite furniture. All my possessions are my favorite possessions, all of which I enjoy every day of my life. How about you? What if you enjoyed everything you owned? How would it make you feel if you were surrounded by your favorite things every day? Favorite Clothes of a Minimalist by Joshua Fields Milburn Quote, Look at all those fancy clothes, but these gonna keep us warm just like those. Jack Johnson What does a minimalist wear? I'm surprised I get this question as often as I do, as if people expect to see me walking around in a loincloth, but given the many misconceptions surrounding minimalism, I suppose it's a valid question. My answer? A minimalist wears his or her favorite clothes every day. Most days I wear jeans, a t-shirt, and a pair of boots. Or when I feel like it, I wear a crisp white button-up shirt, jeans, a blazer, colorful socks, and a clean pair of dress shoes. I avoid logos because I don't enjoy being a walking billboard. I don't have many clothes now, and I still go to the Goodwill a few times a month to donate an item or two. If I'm not wearing it anymore, it gets donated. But I thoroughly enjoy the clothes I own. I don't, however, give sentimental meaning to my clothes. If all my clothes burn in a house fire tomorrow, it wouldn't be a big deal to me. Quote, what about those shoes you're in today? They'll do no good on the bridges you burnt along the way. Jack Johnson. Spill Bleach on Your Wardrobe by Joshua Fields Milburn. What if you spilled bleach on half your wardrobe? What would you do? Some hypothetical questions are so ridiculous, we dismiss them as absurd, laughable queries. Sadly, though, the above question is not purely hypothetical. After returning home from the final leg of our recent tour, fatigued and murky-headed from cross-country traversing, I separated my dirty laundry into appropriate piles, prepping each color-coded assemblage for its usual rinse and spin cycles. Then, unknowingly and stupidly, I spilled a bottle of liquid bleach on literally half the clothes, staining the floor-strewn heaps, instantly ruining the majority of my wardrobe. I was shocked by two things. First, I was shocked by my brainlessness. How could I make such a ridiculous mistake? Truth be told, I simply wasn't paying attention. There's no other explanation. 
If there's a lesson to be learned here, it's that attention must be paid, even during the most mundane tasks. Second, I was shocked I wasn't more horrified by my idiotic mistake. I should be outraged, right? Two years ago, I would have been pissed. I would have fumed angrily and cursed the ceiling and hurled various breakable objects at one or more of my apartment's walls. But last week, as sodium hypochlorite soaked through my threads, I didn't react obnoxiously. Instead, I realized I couldn't control everything. I took a few deep breaths, snatched a mop from my closet, and started cleaning the mess I'd made. The sooner we clean up our mess, the sooner we can move on with life. Sure, half my attire is ruined, but everything's fine. I'll replace some of the clothes if I need to, but my closet isn't upset, and nor should I be. Those clothes were just clothes, replaceable things that don't have any more meaning than the meaning I give to them. There's no case in crying over spilt milk, or in this case, spilt bleach. Things We Walk Away From by Joshua Fields Milburn What are you prepared to walk away from? This oft-unasked question shapes one of the most important principles in my life. We are all familiar with the age-old theoretical situation in which our home is burning and we must grab only the things that are most important to us. Of course, most of us would not dash into the inferno and reach for material things first. We'd ensure the safety of our loved ones and pets. Then once they were safe, we'd grab only the irreplaceable things, photo albums, computer hard drives, family heirlooms, everything else would be lost in the conflagration. I tend to look at this situation a tad differently though, taking the hypothetical a bit further. There's a scene in Heat in which Neil Macaulay, Robert De Niro, says, quote, allow nothing in your life that you cannot walk out on in 30 seconds flat, unquote. Although my life isn't anything like Macaulay's, he's the movie's bad guy, I share his sentiment. Almost everything I bring into my life, material possessions, ideas, habits, and even relationships, I must be able to walk away from at a moment's notice. Many of you will disagree with me because this ideology might sound crass or insensitive, but I like to posit that it is actually the opposite. Our preparedness to walk away is the ultimate form of caring. If I purchase new possessions, I need to make certain I don't assign them too much meaning. Being able to walk away means I won't ever get too attached to my belongings and being unattached to stuff makes our lives tremendously flexible, filled with opportunity. If I take on a new idea or habit, I do so because it has the potential to add value to my life. New ideas shape the future me. Same goes for new habits. Over time, my ideas change, improve, and expand, and my current habits get replaced by new habits that continue to help me grow. Our readiness to walk away from ideas or habits means we're willing to grow. We're willing to constantly pursue a better version of ourselves. If I bring a new relationship into my world, I know I must earn their love, respect, and kindness. I also expect they too are willing to walk away should I not provide the support and understanding they require. This means we must both work hard to contribute to the relationship. We must communicate and remain cognizant of each other's needs. And above all, we must care. These fundaments, love, understanding, caring, communication, build trust, which builds stronger relationships in the long run. It sounds paradoxical, but our willingness to walk away actually strengthens our bond with others. And the opposite stance, being chained by obligation to a relationship, is disingenuous, a false loyalty birthed from pious placation. There are obvious exceptions to this rule. There are certain things we cannot easily walk away from, a marriage, a business partnership, a job that pays the rent, a passion. The key is to have as few exceptions as possible. Naturally, even these exceptions aren't exceptions for everyone. Marriages often end, as do businesses. People get laid off and passions change over time. Even though we might not be able to walk away from these things in 30 seconds flat, we can ultimately walk away when these situations no longer add value to our lives, or worse, when they drain value from our lives. Everything I allow into my life enters it deliberately. If my home was aflame, there's nothing I own that can't be replaced. All my photos are scanned. All my important files are backed up. And all my stuff has no real meaning. Similarly, I'm prepared to walk away from nearly anything, even our website, teaching, or writing, if need be. Doing so safeguards my continued growth and improves my relationships with others, both of which contribute to a fulfilling life, a life of meaning. It was C.S. Lewis who, 50 years ago, eloquently said, quote, don't let your happiness depend on something you may lose, unquote. In today's material world, a world of fear-fueled clinging, his words seem more apropos than ever. Home is Where the Red Phone Is, by Joshua Fields Milburn. I don't enjoy traveling as much as some people. Unless I'm touring, which I'm doing at the time of this writing, which I enjoy because the people are amazing, I tend to avoid exorbitant travel, opting instead to stay home in my community most of the time. 
All my clothes will likely fit in a single suitcase, but I don't enjoy living out of a suitcase. I find value in traversing the globe, in discovering new cultures, and learning more about myself in the process, but I truly enjoy living in a home, a place I can call my own. The problem with homes, however, is once we establish a long-term dwelling, it's easy to accumulate a bunch of junk we don't need. I built my first house when I was 22, a feat that seems ridiculous now, but its size was even more ridiculous. It contained three bedrooms, even though only my former spouse and I lived there. It had a huge basement, which was a great place to hide last month's discarded new possessions, toys I no longer played with. It featured not only a gigantic living room, but also an entertainment room, which I think is pretty much just a fancy way to say room with a too large TV and expensive surround sound system. We think we have to fill all our space, every corner nook and hidden cranny crammed with supposed ornaments. We believe if a room is nearly empty, then it is underutilized. So we buy stuff, silly stock paintings, decorative thingies, and Ikea furniture to fill the void. What we're doing is attempting to establish the place in which we live as our home, an extension of ourselves. And so the logic goes, the more I buy, the more this place is my home. The problem with this line of thinking is it's circuitous. Your home is your home for one reason. You call it your home. The stuff doesn't make it your home. You do. If you need a reminder, you can do what I do. Find one thing, something unique, and display it somewhere prominent. For me, it's a red phone, a relic from my 12 years in the telecom industry. It's a simple, beautiful design that stands out. The same phone is in the Museum of Modern Art. And whenever I see it, I know I'm home. For you, your red phone could be a -a one-of-a-kind painting, a photograph, a child's frame drawing. When you have a single reminder of home, everything else begins to look superfluous, even silly. What is your red phone? I Don't Love You Anymore by Joshua Fields Milburn There weren't any tears during my most recent breakup. No possessions strewn across the lawn. No passive aggression. No yelling, fighting, or angry text messages. There's only a twinge of relief. An unexpected pang of freedom. The moment it all ended, I just stood there, an awkward silence between us. When I finally handed her the bag of clothes, I knew there was no turning back. But her features held no sign of sadness. More like a look of gratitude. As I drove away, I didn't once look in the rear view. Thankfully, this estrangement wasn't with a person, but with a large chunk of my wardrobe. If I would have anthropomorphized that bag of clothes before I handed it to the pretty girl at Goodwill, I would have told it, quote, it's not you. Hell, it's not even me. It's us. We're no longer right for each other. I just don't love you anymore, unquote. I realized it was time for us to part ways just last week after I pulled on a t-shirt and immediately wanted to wear something else. It was a decent shirt, one I got a lot of use out of, but I didn't love wearing it anymore, and I hadn't loved wearing it in a while. So I decided to go through my already minimal closet and dump every item I didn't love. I'd rather own just a few outfits, outfits I enjoy wearing, clothes I feel confident in, a wardrobe that brings me joy, than a mediocre collection of once-loved threads. Sometimes love sunders, and we must move on. The things we once loved, we may not love forever. A Rolex Won't Give You More Time by Joshua Fields Milburn. A friend recently emailed me to communicate the buyer's remorse he was experiencing after purchasing an expensive watch. Even though he's a successful entrepreneur who can afford to drop $10,000 on shiny wrist ornamentation, he expressed pangs of post-purchase grief, sorrow, and regret. He wasn't entirely sure why he felt this way, so he emailed me for advice. This is how I responded. I know where you're coming from. As a guy who has owned several expensive watches, I owned more than one fancy watch during my lotus-eating 20s, although I don't own one now, I understand the allure. I could, of course, recite a dozen platitudes here. An expensive watch can't give you more time. A puppet who enjoys his strings still isn't free. You are not the sum of your material possessions. Our possessions possess us, etc. But it comes down to two things, value and quality of life. In terms of value, does the watch actually add value to your life or does it drain value? I'm not talking about monetary value, price is an arbitrary measurement. I'm talking real intrinsic value. Is that watch worth $10,000 of your freedom? Is it worth the emotional stress you're going through while thinking about it? I know these questions sound rhetorical, but they're not. I'm currently wearing a $100 pair of jeans and yes, they are worth $100 of my freedom to me. They are also my only pair of jeans, therefore I get immense value from them since I wear them almost every day. Does the watch do the same for you? If so, wear it with pride. If it doesn't, then ask yourself why you still own it. Not why you bought it, but why you still own it. Is it a status thing? Is it part of your identity? Is it just an expensive personal logo? 
At this point, the purchase is over. You needn't beat yourself up over it because you can't change it. It's a sunk cost. But you can change what you do going forward if you're not getting value from the purchase. If you get value from the watch, if it truly enhances your life, then why not keep it? And when it comes to quality of life, you need to consider how the watch adds to the quality of your life. I used to earn about $200,000 a year at the peak of my corporate days, but I was miserable. My quality of life was poor. Last year, however, at age 31, I made $27,000, which is actually less than I earned at 18. But with that $27,000, I still saved more than I've ever saved, paid off the rest of my debt, traveled more than I've ever traveled, and experienced life, real life, more than ever before. Though I make a multiplicity of millions less than the corporate bigwigs I once aspired to be, and though I bring home roughly one-eighth of what I used to bring home at my pinnacle, I had appreciably higher quality of life than most CEOs and my former self. Very few material possessions could enhance that quality of life. In fact, most would take away from it. I obviously cannot and will not tell you what to do with your shiny timepiece. What I can tell you is I'm much happier without my expensive watches. Who needs to know the time all the time anyway? I Got Rid of 2,000 Books by Joshua Fields Milburn I used to own 2,000 books, slightly more than that actually. I had all kinds of books, hardcovers, paperbacks, trade paperbacks, literary fiction, writing and grammar books, books of photography, self-help books, my deceased father's collection of old medical journals, genre fiction, those cute little pop-up books, you name it. I had shelves and shelves and more shelves of books, some of which I'd actually read and many of which I'd read someday, you know, whenever I got around to it. Who was I kidding? I thought my overflowing shelves of books made me look important, intelligent, and cool. Look at me, I know how to read, a lot. What's worse, I thought these books made me somebody. They were a part of my identity. Those books were a part of me. And once something's a part of your identity, and once it becomes a part of you, it's exceedingly hard to shed. This is true for anything we incorporate into our identities, our careers, our cars, our homes, our possessions, our sentimental items. These things become part of us, and they become anchors in our lives, anchors that keep us at bay, away from the freedom of the open seas. Ironically, three quotes from a particular book I owned, Chuck Palahniuk's Fight Club, are what inspired me to get rid of the vast majority of my books a little over a year ago. Quote, Reject the basic assumptions of civilization, especially the importance of material possessions. Quote, The things you own end up owning you. Quote, It's only after we've lost everything that we're free to do anything. Unquote. These words resonated with me deeply. I could feel on my nerve endings what Palahniuk was saying. I read those quotes several times and within a week sold or donated 98% of my books. I purchased a Kindle and kept one shelf of my favorite physical books. Some older books aren't yet on Kindle, which is a shame. In those rare cases, I'll get the book elsewhere, a public library, a local independent bookstore, online. And when I'm finished reading it, I'll often donate it. I no longer own piles of books, but I read more than before. I enjoy each book, taking them in slowly, absorbing the knowledge, processing the information, contemplating their lessons, but I needn't retain the physical book to get value from its words. Think about it. How much value was I placing in all the books I owned? Obviously, it was far more than their real value. The real value was in the words, in the action of reading, not in the physical books themselves. Letting go of your DVD collection. Are you one of those people who collects DVDs proudly displaying your stockpile on a wall, shelf, or special area designated for your dozens of favorite movies? Have you thought about why you own all those DVDs? Do you really plan to rewatch the same movies three, four, or a dozen times? Both of us had fairly sizable DVD collections before taking our journeys into minimalism. We wasted thousands of dollars on these collections, often purchasing movies we'd already seen. And then we allowed our extensive collections to collect dust or we'd occasionally rewatch a movie living in the past, attempting to reconstruct an old moment instead of creating new ones. But collecting is just hoarding with a prettier name. Don't believe us? Look it up. The Oxford American Writers Thesaurus lists the following synonyms under the first definition of collection. Hoard, pile, heap, stockpile. Yes, collecting things you don't need, things you don't get value from, is tantamount to hoarding. The two of us still watch movies, but we watch new movies, creating new experiences in our lives. We strengthen our relationships by enjoying movies with friends. We grow by talking about those experiences after they happen, developing a better understanding of ourselves in the process. Let go of that DVD collection. You can sell it and make some money. And stop watching the same things over and over. Live your life instead. 
There's an entire world out there and there's so much value you can add to that world. So much you can contribute beyond yourself. We're certain of it. Or how about this? Keep the movies that add value to your life. There's nothing wrong with an occasional rerun, a glance in the rear view, but then look forward and let go of the rest. More is less? Less is more. We all know this saying, first popularized by minimalist architect Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, which has been transformed into a platitude by advertisers, TV shows, and even corporate America as it right-sizes people out of their livelihoods. Quote, we'll have to learn to do more with less around here, unquote. But is less really more? And if so, is the opposite true? Is more actually less? Questions like this may be more important than you think. The two of us enjoy taking commonly accepted truisms and trite stock phrases and flipping them on their axes, exploring the obverse side of cliches and hackneyed phrases, shedding light on the opposite sides of supposed facts. For example, what moniker does our culture often assign to a well-adjusted, ostensibly successful person? We often say that these people are anchored. Quote, he is such an anchored person, unquote. We heard this term frequently during our late 20s. We were regularly described as anchored people. And for the longest time, we took this as a compliment. Then we stopped taking it at face value and asked, what is an anchor? That question led us to an important discovery about our lives. An anchor is the thing that keeps a ship at bay, planted in the harbor, stuck in one place, unable to explore the freedom of the sea. Perhaps we were anchored. We knew we weren't happy with our lives. And perhaps being anchored wasn't necessarily a good thing. In the course of time, we each identified our own personal anchors, circumstances keeping us from realizing real freedom, and found they were plentiful. Joshua cataloged 83 anchors, Ryan 54. We discovered big anchors, debt, bad relationships, etc., and small anchors, superfluous bills, material possessions, etc., and in time we eliminated the vast majority of those anchors, one by one, documenting our experience in our first book, Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life. It turned out being anchored was a terrible thing, It kept us from leading the lives we wanted to lead. Not all our anchors were bad, but the vast majority prevented us from encountering lasting contentment. Are you an anchored person? Is that a good thing? What are some of your anchors? And what other axioms might you want to question? Which brings us back to our original set of questions. Is less really more? If so, is more actually less? We suggest the answer to both is yes. Owning less stuff, focusing on fewer tasks, and having less in the way has given us more time, more freedom, and more meaning in our lives. Working less allows us to contribute more, grow more, and pursue our passions much more. Having more time causes less frustration and less stress. More freedom adds less anxiety and less worry. And more meaning in our lives allows us to focus far less on life's excess in favor of what's truly important. So, more is less? Yes, more or less. (laughs) 